On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about how we periodize strength training after surgeries such as ACL reconstruction. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back everybody to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. We're up at Champion PT Performance up in Boston. Lenny McCrina, Dave Tilly, Lisa Russell, Dan Pope, Mike Scuduto. Mixing it up. <laughs> we, we are here answering your questions. Lenny, would you like to introduce the students today? I'd love to introduce the students. From right to left, we have Joe Gawet from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, we have Andrew King from the University of Hartford, Connecticut. And we have Austin Riffraff from the, uh, Franklin Pierce University in the great state of Arizona, not New Hampshire. All right, we need to hear from you. Do we need to get back to nicknames? I feel like we need to get back to nicknames. Could you just call him Aladdin? Call uh, him T.I. for the king. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. That's <laughs> my <laughs> Dave just started it right there. Just started. All right, so comment on this. We want to hear, do we need more nicknames? Do we need to go back to the nick- nickname. So uh, let me see. If I, if I can figure out what these students are up to behind me, I'm going to say... Austin's up. That's right. Ah, I figured out their patterning. Austin, what do we have for a question today? All right, we got Dan from Minnesota. Oh, yeah. You've oh, talked yeah. several times on your podcast about certifications to learn about weight training and becoming proficient at learning those movements. What about periodization principles for a post op ACL? How do you periodize a strength program to get a quad back to 90%? I like that. So, Dan from Minnesota, excellent question where they, but that I totally just reminded myself. You, you listen to fantasy sports radio on XM Radio, right? Not to completely change topics. Yes, it's just it's so nerdy. That that it's awful. Well, that's why you, during the football that's why Mike season. loses that's every time. Kind of especially no. during the football season. Do, do they still have the guys in the morning that like make fun of where everybody's from? Like they have the the. He goes, "How you doing, boy?" Every time somebody from the south calls in, it's hilarious. Because I just said Minnesota. Uh, but anyway, so Dan. Good question, right? We do. We have talked a lot about physical therapists getting into weight training and how to do that, right? And there's tons of ways to do it. Probably the best way is the fitness pain-free certification. Wow. Whoa! <laughs> no, but in full sincerity, yes, absolutely. But but um, but I like how you asked your question. It's not about learning the lifts. It's not about learning how to do them, how to coach them, how to fix them, how to optimize them, right? But it's also about how to periodize them, which is more programming. So great question. So how do we periodize? And I actually used ACL as an example. It's good. How do we periodize a rehab strength training program? I know. These laces always come undone. If only I had nobles. <laughs> um, First, I want to say it was Dan from Minnesota, right? 90% quad return is not good enough. So rephrase the question or wow. rethink your thoughts. Wow. 90%. Yeah. Wow. I don't know where this is coming from in the in the world of PT, but 90% return to quads is... It's a good point. 10% stinks. <laughs> right. And your other leg's weaker because you had a really bad year. Yeah. Right? Um, so, that's yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That would be my initial if we're going to paradise. Let's get I like them. it. All right. So, why don't we start with Dan and get you in here. Period- periodizing... How do we periodize? The more you say it, it gets harder every time. Yeah. How, how, do you do the, how do you do that for a post-op rehab patient? What, what's your strategies? What do you do? Yeah. All right. I think I, I thought about this question a little bit. Um, in terms of the word periodization, I think periodization has to do with having a sport that you're preparing for, right? So part of periodization is basically like, what are you trying to achieve? What's your end goal? What are you trying to get to, right? So I think the simple way to explain it, or at least the way it works in my head, is that you have an end goal, so probably playing a sport, I'm guessing, right? And then you're starting at a very low level. How do we connect those two? Right. right? Um, at least in my mind, and I know you asked specifically about the quad, but for let's say it's field sport, say ACL, I usually think field sport. We have to be able to accelerate. We have to be able to do top end sprinting. We have to be able to change direction. And we have to layer in endurance on top of that. Right. So maybe you're not starting on some of those things until about three months or so because you're working on trying to get inflammation down or get swelling down, get pain to go away, getting all those initial stages of rehab down 
Um, but as soon as we can start working on those things, we're going to start at a very low level and then just progress those over the course of time so we meet that person where they need to be at the end stage. Yeah. All right, so good first dip into periodizing is the qualities, right? Because it's not just about sets and reps. You know, that is a yeah. big part of periodizing, but usually we, we tweak sets and reps because we're working on different qualities, right? But I like what Dan kind of said here. It's like you have to start again with the end in mind. We talk about that a lot, about what qualities you need to get back to the activity you want to get to and make sure you're building a program that, that sequentially adds in those qualities. That is one form of periodizing. Right, so I think the other big one in rehab that we always talk about being guilty of is rehab tends to do three sets of 10 on everything for forever. And they tend to stay with low weights because we're oftentimes afraid to load because we're worried about people, right? So who wants to comment on that? Maybe Len, yeah, that you're, was, well Dave, you can start too, but like maybe you guys, because you guys do like a lot of, you get do a lot of athletes come back from, from injuries and Len, you do a lot of knees and ACLs. Like, yes, we start with two or three sets of 10, right? How do you progress that and where do you go and why? How do you know when to progress that? Yeah, I mean, in my head, I'm thinking about movement. So where do I want them to get to is some form of heavy front squat, back squat, um, you know, single leg stuff. So I need to get them there. So I am teaching how to hinge at the beginning. I'm teaching them, um, I'm teaching them just an air squat to a goblet squat to some form of heavier loaded front squat to a back squat so in my head i know where i want to get them i just need to know that they can move correctly to get there and i slowly add resistance so weight training so extra weights so for me yeah i may start off two to three sets of ten but then they start going into sets of six to eight um, when i i get feedback from them what was the amount of effort that was needed to get through that set you know, and then I get feedback from them with the weight, and then I slowly take add more weight and take away reps because now I want to work on more, you know, strength and, and and heavier loads. So after an injury, they've transitioned from that like neuromuscular deficit, right. they're starting to get strength gains. So if we continue to just do three sets of ten, then you could argue we're, we're potentially not challenging them enough. We need to right. increase the intensity. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, well, kind of marrying what you guys both said is I think a problem that physical therapists have in general is, is they don't really understand what's a normal expected response to adaptation or just soreness or like healthy kind of discomfort versus what's pathological or what's maybe limited by the, the tissue itself that's still healing. I think if you don't really understand what a normal versus a abnormal response to a training effect is or a training session, that's where you start to get into hot water, right? So say for example, someone who's getting back to doing some front squats or they're doing some like low level plyometrics before they start a running program, if they have like very much patellar tendon or like, you know, something in their joint that's sore the next day, you should be aware of that and be concerned and you have to modify the program versus if you just train really a good program and like your quads are sore and you feel tired and you're a little drained, like that's a good thing. We want that. And I think sometimes as, as physical therapists, we don't really know what's kind of like the response we want and vice versa. We don't know how to program or give people the right dosage of exercise to cause a, a, a positive adaptation. So I counted, you took two breaths during all that. <laughs> no coffee. That was right, that was impressive. No coffee, no tea. So obviously an amazing response, right? So that's a whole other thing. Dan talked about qualities. Lenny talked about movements a little bit. Dave, Dave now talking about adaptations and how do you achieve those adaptations, which I think that's the thing that some of the physical therapists kind of do. So for the sake of time, I think, I, you, 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 anything? Um. That's all right. You don't have to ask. Yeah, yeah. For, for, the, for the sake of time, I think I think I would summarize a, a typical scenario for what I do. So I always start with linear periodiz periodization. God, the more I say that, it's getting hard. <laughs> always linear. Why? Because they're really weak, right? They're neuromuscularly inhibited, right? They have these issues. So what we do is we, we keep very similar set rep schemes, like two or three sets of 10, and we go up and wait once, you know, you know, each week or whatever it may be, each session, whatever it may be. That's classic physical therapy. That's why we have all these millions of ankle weights and dumbbells, right? From one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, you know, like all these different like weights. So we linear load that over time until they've started to have a good response and once they start to need to actually get stronger and you need to go up and wait then you have to decrease the volume the sets and the reps so that's like the first step that I do when I periodize somebody come back from injury is we linear load until we've kind of maximized as far as we can go with that and that can take months theoretically, right? That doesn't mean you have to, but most people aren't trained well enough that we have to get fancy periodization schemes, right? We don't have to get fancy because 
their challenge to their system to adapt is relatively easy to accomplish. So we linear load for like a, a, a decent amount of time. And then what, what we do over time is once we run out of kind of like weight, what we start to do is go up and wait and go down in reps. And you could argue that's still a bit of linear periodization, but now we're going in the other direction, right? We kind of do that before we even talk about anything else. So don't be afraid of the linear load, but like build it up over time. Yeah. Do you continue at that point? Would you continue isolated, maybe open chain uh, strengthening of the quad or does that kind of go away? as you get into more of a gym-based program. So once they're getting super advanced, my progression from linear then is to then do conjugated where we're actually now putting multiple qualities at the same time. So at the beginning, there is no point on doing, you know, low set rep schemes, like five sets of five, three sets of five, because they're only doing a very small percentage of what they can probably handle because their body's not ready for that stress, right? So that's kind of how I start with it there. But once they're starting to put some maximal effort into it, I think it's very short-sighted with somebody coming back from rehab that needs to be working on multiple qualities and working on multiple movements and working on the correct adaptations. We need to put those together in, in our program. So we have certain exercises like our main lifts that might be three sets of five, right? And then we may have accessory lifts that are, you know, two sets of 15 or 20 even. Maybe we're trying to build some endurance and some single leg stability based things and we're trying to get really strong on some of the main lifts, right? So I, I think that's how I would put it together. I mean, anybody else want to- answer your question, you know, I would still do both if that was- Right. I would, that, which is I think what you said, Mike, is, yeah, you, you, you have your main lift in mind. So for me, I usually like to have a squat and a hinge in there or, or, or something of that nature in, in somebody's program. And, and so at the end, I'll also incorporate some blood flow restriction stuff as far out as possible. Like I, I don't mind doing that forever with somebody uh, after an ACL rehab because I want, a re I want the main lift to be there at their strongest. But then I want to get some isolation type activities, specifically of the quads, because we know the quads are going to drive the athlete when they're getting back to their sport. So if they need a strong quad, not just 90% quad. So we, we, I, I still do isolated knee extensions, even with BFR or not. We don't have a knee extension machine yet, so I have to use BFR to get the fatigue factor with the lower amount of ankle weights that we have here. So I can load them with maybe a 20 pound ankle weight and have them do it with the cuff on them and they're going to get a good isolation of their quads after they've done their lift and so that's to, to me a, how I think is the best way right now to get the quads engaged because we know that's the issue coming back after an ACL but I think you know hopefully some of this periodization talk is good for you because I think it, it is important because I think as PTs traditionally the insurance based model fails these athletes because we get them three four months out where we're doing three sets of ten because that's still a challenge for them and then after three or four months their insurance runs out and now where do they go they they go to fitness trainers, they go to personal trainers they go on their own and the failure rate is so high so I think it's a great question to educate the audience because we fail miserably as PTs at this to understand how to progress people from four months to nine to 12 months out of surgery because it's it's that lost area. It's that lost area of where people go to rehab. We probably fail at, at loading them enough to get adaptation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So awesome. Great question. If you have anything like that, head to micronal.com, click on that podcast link, and you can fill out the form to ask us more questions like that. And what's we'll it? What do you say? Uh, we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> Hopefully in the future. <laughs>